Hello, peoples, and welcome to Esoterica Cinema, the podcast where we take films from the cinematic multiverse and discuss the hell out of them. My name is Jason Peters, and I am with you here today for another patented five-minute review. I got five on it. Today, we are looking at the 2009 film Antichrist, written and directed by Lars von Trier, photographed by Anthony Dodd-Mantle, and starring Willem Dafoe and Charlotte Gainsbourg. It tells the story of a couple who, after the accidental death of their son, retreat to a cabin in the woods where the man experiences strange visions and the woman manifests increasingly violent sexual behavior and sadomasochism. We have such sights to show you. I know, a little jarring, right? That's a description from Google, and it's actually rather on point. Uh, this is definitely a film that is not afraid to examine some pretty intense sexual and violence themes, as well as the actual acts themselves. So needless to say, not a film you're going to want to watch with your mom, your grandma, or anybody but maybe your uh, significant other. I don't even think you'd really want to get together with your friends like a bunch of buds get together. Hey, let's watch Antichrist. Probably not going to be as much fun as you'd have with another film. Now, this is defined as a horror movie, but to me, it's much more a subversive psychosexual examination of loss and relationship dynamics, okay? Right off the bat, as we heard in the description, the couple loses their son, and they actually do so uh, while they're in the middle of banging to this, like, it's, it's all in slow motion, it's very artsy, it's in black and white, and it's like, just, if you know anything about Lars von Trier, it's the most Lars von Trier thing he could do, just big middle finger to the audience, right up front, and that's going to continue throughout the film. It's not a traditional horror film from the standpoint of there's, like, zero jump scares, and it's really more about this existential dread that just continues to pick up and expand and manifest throughout the entire, I don't know, 140 minutes, I think it is maybe, 150 minutes, somewhere between there. And it's just very deliberate, and it ratchets up that sexual horror slowly. Now, there's also some really interesting techniques. They use effective use of frame splicing. We've got strong use of orchestral stabs and score. There's also these really creepy title cards. I don't know what artist he got to do the font on them, but that's it's sort of uh, painted in this very sort of almost like seven-ish sort of way, right? It gives you like creepy serial killer vibes or something like that. Kind of reminds me of something out of like the Mark Romanek Closer video that he did for Trent Reznor. Playing the leads in the film are Willem Dafoe and Charlotte Gainsbourg. Now, I don't know that I've seen Charlotte Gainsbourg in anything, but if you know the show, you know we love us some Willem Dafoe. He's good. He's great in it, even. It's not, I don't think he's being asked to do much, and he kind of has like a, he's playing like a therapist, so he's got this sort of lower register delivery. It's kind of, it's kind of a little bit NPR-ish, and he talks to his wife in very measured responses, right? And Gainsbourg's the one who really gets to go sort of over the top, and Boy, they really do go over the top, and I mean that sexually as much as anything else. Again, this is a very graphic film, both in its violence but also in its sex, and apparently to the point that, like, they had to get uh, porn stars to to be some of the body doubles because uh, they were asked to be doing such explicit things. And, again, you know, they don't shy away from the on the film, so you have to be prepared for that if you're going to strap in for this movie. And then as far as Gainberg's arc, you know, she starts out very troubled right off the bat and it, and it ratchets up over the course of the film pretty consistently to the point where she's pretty much just, you know, bad shit, crazy, insane by the end of it. So and she does that very well. She plays psychologically scarred really well and she plays the sort of uh, ratcheted up uh, crazy girl. Well, so great performance all around there. And the thing about both of these performances is that they can be very, very loud. Loud! <laughs> But when they're not very loud, they're actually surprisingly quiet and they have like subtle effects that they employ to their speech and to their deliveries. So some pretty nuanced performances here in an otherwise very, very graphic film. Now, the score and sound design is by a gentleman named Christian Eidness Anderson, and I had never heard of him, but he is apparently Lars von Trier's boy. He's pretty much done the music and sound design for all of his films. And yes, he did do both the music and the sound design. I thought that was a really strong choice because then you don't have two people sort of like fighting each other for screen space, right? One of the things that works very well about this film is how quiet it is and how willing it is to just sort of let 
there be space in between the dialogue and just sort of appreciate some of these ambient tones or maybe some of these droning tones that give you this sort of off sense, off kilter sensibility, right? It's really well done. And it, I mean, some of these scenes are even almost silent the way that they're presented, uh, but it's done to great effect. And the cinematography by Anthony Dodd Mantle really is something to behold. Now, I will say that some of the digital shows its age. They shot most of the film on red ones. And so the technology was still developing. It wasn't to where it is today. Von Trier does do some interesting manipulation of the outside environment to sort of skew the surroundings and play with that a little bit. And then they've got these slow motion shots photographed on Phantom V4 high speeds. And these are just wonderful. You don't know, but you've seen these cameras on everything from like Jackass movies to Thor Ragnarok. And it's these hyper slow mo shots that just give you so much rich detail. And each of these shots is maybe, I don't know, four to six in the entire film. Just unbelievably gorgeous, haunting, beautiful, very evocative of the imagery and the tone. It's these crystal clear wide shots that are exteriors in the middle of the forest. They're perfectly framed. They're perfectly lit. They almost look like paintings. Even the way that the actors and the actresses are moving, it's just wonderful. And as for the faults, it really just, you know, depends on your tolerance for sex and violence like I was talking about. It's really graphic and it's actually somewhat of an unpleasant film. Like, you can tell Von Trier was going through some stuff and that he's probably an unpleasant individual most of the time. I don't know you, but I'm sure you're a jerk. Because, yeah, it's 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 an ugly film and it doesn't have a nice worldview, you know. It basically comes to the conclusion that there's just, like, evil people in the world. And specifically, there's evil women in the world. And I don't know if he was sort of working through a marriage or something like that, but it definitely feels like he's working through something that has to do with his relationship and his view of the women in his life. And it actually turns out that in doing a little bit of research, Von Trier was struggling with some deep depression when he made this movie to the point that it's actually the start of what he calls his depression trilogy, which would extend through to melancholia and then finish with parts one and two of nymphomaniac. Again, really depends on what you're looking for when you go to a horror film like that. It's not fun horror the way that, like, Halloween or Evil Dead is going to be. This is more like, hey, let's take a serious look at marriage and relationships and imbue this sort of horror story along the way. Three adjectives for the film. Beautiful, uncomfortable, and unpleasant. As far as a formal star rating, I went back and forth. This is probably one of the harder ratings that I've ever had to give, to be completely honest, but given all of the artistic merit and the fact that I personally have something of a tolerance for the material that is presented here, I'm going to go ahead and give it four out of five stars, which was a lot higher than I thought that I was going to give, but when I reflected on it, there's really a lot to appreciate about the film, and I think that's kind of one of the important things to understand, is that this may be a film that you appreciate more than you enjoy, I don't believe that I'm going to watch this film again. If so, it's going to be very far down the road. But yeah, it's definitely one of those four-star films where you're like, cool, glad I saw it, check it off the list, have an opinion on it. It was strong, had a lot of merits, but again, just a very deeply unpleasant film that I don't want to go back to numerous times. Going to leave you with a question to call us at the Esoterica Cinema Hotline with, does the film's beauty outweigh its graphic violence? Which wins out for you? Let us know, 818 818- 483-6285, Esoterica Cinema Hotline. We'll get your answer on one of the shows. And as far as where you can see this film, it's a bunch of places, but I'm going to plug Canopy.com. You've heard me talk about it before. Canopy.com, free streaming site. All you need is a library card. You can get one digitally in three seconds if you don't have one. Check it out. Wonderful films there. And we will see you for our next five-minute review or one of our long-form reviews right here on Esoterica Cinema. Thanks for listening.